So do I get it? Where's the slides? <laughs> no slides. Uh, well, ah, oh, there. Uh, well, I'm the co-author. Uh, he was graciously, he graciously listed me on the slides as co-author, but he did all of the work. Um, I, ha I visited him in 2013. I haven't seen it since then, and he asked me to present this, so I've had a lot of catching up to do uh, in the last three or four weeks. Um, but I did help him write his previous papers as well. Okay, so how do you do this? Click. Okay, good. In these experiments, glow discharge electrolysis between palladium and nickel produces excess heat. Um, oh my, it went right through. <laughs> Go back to the previous slide, perhaps? Yeah. This is quite a touchy little machine, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, he did it previously for, for many years with a very complicated, long process. It took months or years to produce the effect. This was described at ICCF 18. It, this, the results were spectacular in some cases. Input was twice out, uh, out, I'm sorry, output was twice input and it lasted for months. Uh, occasionally it reached hundreds of watts. And there was a very clear trend that raising the temperature increased the output energy. The problem was it took years and he could not explore the parameter space and he, so he looked around for a way to improve, make it go faster. And he determined that if you apply palladium directly to the nickel mesh before the test, it works in a week or two. It works very quickly. Unfortunately, the excess went down to around 5 to 20 percent, and the heat is only 20 to 30 watts, 40 watts in one case. Okay. Uh, oh, I still don't know how you get this anywhere. Okay. There's the calorimeter, uh, the equipment cabinet on the left there. Uh, the calorimeter is. An airflow calorimeter, it's, it's, uh, it's, co it's covered with the reflective padded aluminum insulation you see there, but it's been removed for the, uh, I don't know what's with this thing here. It's been removed to, to, so you can see inside. There are two cells in, one, in there right now. One is the control, the other is the uh, active cell. Um, he, he, he did a variety of different other calorimetry methods, but airflow is much better because it's a high temperature experiment. The other methods actually interfered with the reaction, as you'll see. Uh, as I said, it's covered with insulation, and that's high-tech insulation. Both the inside and the outside are covered. And you notice there's a blower on the top of the box there, which is how the, cal how the calorimetry works. The blower uh, pulls the air in from the bottom. It goes out the top. I, is it, could somebody, maybe the people back there can, are operating this thing. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, the calorimetry is all based on the difference between the inlet and the outlet air temperature, but you should record other temperatures, such as the, the um, reactor surface, the reactor inside, the reactor bottom wall, the air temperature in the box. It's essential to record many different temperatures because you get a lot of information from the other temperatures. He does a lot of uh, clever reality checks, such as letting incense smoke go into the box, and timing how long it takes to come out again. This also shows him that the smoke is swirling around both of the reactors. The air distribution is very good. Now, if I can make this thing work. Ah, there's two different kinds of reactors. One of them is a large uh, X-shaped cruciform reactor. The other one is a horizontal one. Um, they both have these windows at the end. Uh, Kovar glass windows. If you do this experiment, it's essential that you be able to look in to the reactor and see the plasma forming, see where it's going. Uh, it's great help. Now, I, I, I drew a red box around the uh, second uh, horizontal reactor. That's the control in this case. They're both placed in the box right next to one another. Um, let me see here. Looking inside the reactor. You have a, uh, a palladium rod in the center there. That's off on the right. Uh, it's 250 millimeters long, and wound around it is a palladium wire. That's the uh, positive electrode. The negative electrode is uh, a nickel mesh, and it's placed on the walls, the inside walls of the reactor. I hope you can see that. It's placed right up against those walls, um, and that's very important. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, it, the mesh is connected to ground. 
okay, high pressure glow discharge is done with either hydrogen or deuterium at, at pressures between one and several kilopascals. Um, now, the, the thing about the, the, the nickel being against the wall is there's indications that the nickel, react, the nickel is where the reaction is occurring. The evidence for this is two things. First, the reaction increases when you heat up the wall of that from the outside there. That's really annoying. Um, and it also increases when you put palladium on there directly. And when you, and when you add lots of palladium to the, to the mesh, it, it makes it, uh, it bumps up the reaction considerably. Well, as I said before, there are two reactors. This is a, a better photograph you can see there placed right next to one another. They are the same size and design, always. Either the, th this type or the other type, or the same size are placed in the, in, the, uh, in, the react in the chamber there. One is the control, the other is the active one. In this case, the control reactor is heated on the outside, uh, but it's still filled with the same gas and the same electrodes at the same pressure and the two are periodically swapped. The control becomes the active cell and vice versa. Left in the box, you swap them, you get the same result from the control run without changing any conditions in the box. That's very important. This illustrates how long the experiment used to take. That's uh, 100 million milliseconds, which is to say 3.2 years. The gas pressure is in green, the input power is in red, and then the balance, the heat balance, is the black line. And you can see right up to around 40, it doesn't do very much. It's one. It's a balance. Uh, so it didn't do anything for, what is that, a year, a year and a half or so. Uh, and then around 50 milliseconds, it rose, and then it fell right back down again. So this ratio remained low, we now believe, because the cell was placed in a water-based calorimeter, which was... Um, Cooling it down, it kept, it kept the shell, it kept the, it kept the nickel mesh at a low temperature. So at, at, at 53 milli, um, megaseconds, I'm sorry, he picked the cell up and put it into the airflow calorimeter. And uh, the wall temperature rose and substantial excess heat began. Well, you can sort of see it went up to almost up to two there. So then he did other things. At 55, he added helium gas, which I don't think did anything. And then at 64 megaseconds, he uh, put new D2 gas. And then finally, toward the end, I, I wish I had a pointer. I, I don't, but I, I, if I put this thing down, it will start flipping out on me. <laughs> it did again. <laughs> at 92, at 92 uh, megaseconds, he introduced air into the cell, and he, the, it, uh, it clobbered the reaction. It deactivated the reaction. Oh, I've got one, but if I put this other thing down, it's going to, uh, <laughs> let me try this one for a second. 92, right, right, well, you can just look, look at the numbers. I, don't, I'm, I, I tried to make these slides without, that they don't require any pointing. At 92, he put air into it, and it just clobbered the reaction, turned it off. Uh, it felt, the, the ratio didn't, it didn't stop altogether. The ratio fell to about 1.2 from, from 2, down to 1.2. And then he ended the experiment at 100, as you see. Okay, so let me look at another view of that same data set. This is the same experiment viewed a different way. Oh, boy. Uh, there's three sources of input power into the cell. One is the glow discharge. Two is the ceramic heater placed in the middle of the cell. That's the, uh, the, red, dot, the red dots. And three is the, re the heater wrapped around the top. That's the blue dots. Now, at uh, ooh, 22, 22, he moved it to the other calorimeter, and he turned off the ceramic heater, turned on the external heater exclusively, only blue dots from then on, and the temperature, and I'm sorry, the output power went way up. The, the ratio went up to two, and it stayed there until, as I said, he clobbered it with air to, at the end. Uh, turned it off deliberately. Okay, so here is a uh, calibration test with the airflow calorimeter. Jeez uh, Louise. You can see that there were three power levels, 80, 120, and 248. Uh, and actually, I intended to flip back and forth between them because the next slide shows a dramatic difference. This is the live run with the same power levels, the same reactor, the same reactors, the same calorimeter, completely different result. 
completely different. Uh, this is only for one day, actually. You see it keeps going up all up during the day, and then, uh, then it falls down. And that, that, it's just, uh, uh, that, that's, that's about, uh, how much is that now? That's uh, uh, 480 watts, twice input. OK. Uh, he plots the excess heat. I wish this thing would stop doing that. <laughs> can, can the people in the back want to control this? Because I can't make it stop flipping by itself. It's really annoying. That's a plot of the uh, power, as you see. Uh, the higher the temperature, the higher the amount of excess heat. It's expressed as an exponential function here. The temperature is in Kelvin. And it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's 1 over t. Now, Mizuno thinks if you go down to the low end of that curve, you can learn something about the uh, mechanism, the reaction mechanism, by determining the activation energy as 0 0.165 eV per k per atom. Ed Storms doesn't think so. I'll let them discuss that. Looking at the other intercept at the high end there, if you were to follow it up, it would reach about a kilowatt at around 700 degrees Celsius, which is very promising. That's an easy temperature to reach. And that's much better power density and better Carnot efficiency than a fission reactor core. Well, this is data from the old experiments showing the increase in uh, temperature at higher temperatures. The new experiments also show the same trend, even though the power level is much lower. They also increase in considerably with, uh, with higher temperatures. OK, so now I'm going to go to the new methods, which is to simply, what happened was, as I said, Mizuno noticed that the palladium was gradually getting sputtered with nickel. It's obvious. You could tell. Uh, and he thought, well, rather than wait for it to happen over months and weeks, uh, I should just put it on there to start with. So the first method he did was to take a palladium rod and just scrape the nickel mesh. First he washes, and I'm sorry, he washes the nickel mesh, then he scrapes it with the palladium rod, and then he puts it into the reactor pumps it down to get rid of the water and air, puts in some hydrogen gas, pumps it out again, in again, out again, three or four times. With the previous experiment, he would do that for weeks, hundreds of times. In this case, he's only doing it for a few days. Um, again, it's around the inside of the furnace, as you see there. Uh, then the other method he has used is to electrolyze uh, thin plating with the coating composition shown on the bottom there. Uh, he did, let's see here, he did 38 tests of active material, 19 with each of these two techniques. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, they only produce a small effect compared to the previous one. Here's an example. This one is rather iffy in my opinion. Uh, the left is the calibration. The input ratio, the output to input ratio is 0 0.989, meaning 99% of the input power is being recovered. Uh, the right one shows a ratio of 1.06, 6 percent excess. Now, speaking for myself here, I don't believe that he's actually recovering 99 percent. That sounds impossible, but there it is. Now, here's a 12 percent one, a little bit better. As I said, it went up to uh, 20 percent in some cases, but I just showed these two examples. Um, I just want to point out that the energy is measured from the time the experiment turns on past where it turns off there, right to the uh, next day, really, where the, uh, ambient where the cell returns to the ambient temperature. So then what you do, th the data is collected directly into spreadsheets. So all you have to do is tell the spreadsheet to compute the number of joules for each five-second interval. It collects it every five seconds. You, you add them, you t t tell it to collect, uh, I'm sorry, collect them tally the totals for each one, and then you add them all up to get 2,487,819 joules, which is obviously the illusion of high precision. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it, you do that with both the input and the output. And, and it's, it's rather jittery looking because these are the individual five-second readings. Uh, you know, if you do any, any sort of um, averaging, it comes out much smoother, obviously. But we wanted you to see how it looks f in the raw data. OK, so uh, this is from the poster session. You can see all of his results in a table. And I showed the, I put a red block around the one we just saw, the 12% excess. Uh, 
but that's in part, uh, let me just show you a graphic representation of all the results, dots. Uh, he did the, uh, let me see if I can use this thing for a second here. He did the, first he did a bunch of rubbed experiments and then he did a bunch of electrolyst deposited experiments. These are listed in, shown in chronological order. Um, each dot represents one test. The control tests are blue, the active tests are orange. Um, as you see, the experiment kind of stopped working uh, it's, uh, uh, back there, and it doesn't, hasn't been working very well up here. Let me just, it, it sort of stopped working over here. Hasn't been doing very much over there. Um, uh, let me see here. There's 38 active tests, as I said. Five of them produced 15% or more. Uh, most of the control calibrations, the blue dots, that is, most of them are at uh, 100 or 200 watts, when the recovery rate is 99%. The box temperature, the temperature of the air is swirling around the box is 36 degrees Celsius. Now, there's one dot there, way down below the line, if I can get this damn thing to stop moving. There's one dot there. That's a 500 watt calibration, and the recovery rate is is what? It's around 90%, 89%. Because the box was 50 degrees, so it lost more heat. So that's what you expect, that's good. Now when you convert this uh, from percentages to actual power, absolute power, some of those dots are considerably higher. The gap is greater. It's, 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 it looks better. Uh, one of them is 40 watts. Uh, I don't have time to discuss it, but there's a bonus slide, and you can talk about it in the uh, poster session. Okay, so let me just talk about that 99% recovery rate because it's, it's, it's this thing that seems most unbelievable. Uh, well, it's taken with airflow calorimetry, which means you, from the experiment, you take the input power, the duct diameter, the airspeed, the inlet temperature. From the textbooks, you take the weight of air and the heat capacity of air. Uh, then you use online cheat sheets to determine that 18 grams of air are passing through the reactor every second. Uh, you compute the heat by multiplying the, the weight of air times the heat capacity times degrees Kelvin. It comes out to be 0 0.198 kilojoules per second, which is to say 198 watts, which is two watts less than input. That's how we got the answer. Now, I find it hard to believe, but then again, there are indications that it's working, as I just said. With 500 watts of input during the calibration, you, you lose a lot more than uh, two watts. Uh, I haven't seen other calibrations, but he tells me that it, does, it goes lower and lower as the temperature is higher and higher, as you would expect, of course. So let me just, just devote the rest of this talk to that uh, briefly, because that's, calorimetry is at the heart of the claims. Um, well, regarding the 5% excess, I don't know. I haven't heard yet what the uh, margin of error is, but it has to be close. And 15 to 20 percent is more believable, I think. Well, a number of people visited Mizuno, and other people discussed his paper, his JCMNS paper, uh, and they came up with a list of problems which Mizuno has addressed. He's, he's been careful to address, the, the, you know, the problems, and uh, he's been responsive, and I think we should give him credit for that. Someone said that maybe uh, one of the cells is in better contact with the table than the other, and it's conducting more heat. Uh, he showed that's not the case by swapping them. Um, that was a good test, I think. I wondered whether the resistance heating itself is somehow conducts more heat to the table than, than uh, glow discharge. He showed that a glow discharge experiment with ordinary nickel with no palladium involved produces the same amount of heat as uh, a resistance heating. There's no measurable distance, difference at all. Uh, the, the key to it, the, the reason why you should believe him is because this is not just flow calorimetry. It's flow calorimetry with calibrations. So in order to show there's a mistake, you have to find not one error, but two. Uh, some of the people discussing this said, well, you know, the duct diameter might be wrong. The airspeed is a little bit wrong. The measurement might be off by as much as 20%. That's where I, I drew the red line there. It's 20%, perhaps. I, I don't think so, but that's what they said. Uh, so it's not 
they said it's not really recovering more energy in than uh, out than you're putting in. It's the, the balance could be negative. Um, well, that that's that's so far that's that's true. But there's this gap, as you see, between the control runs and the excess heat runs, and and it. it even if the calorimetry is wrong, that is definitely the zero line down there. Wh whatever that represents, that's the zero line, and the excess heat is above it. You, you can dispute how much there is, but you can't really dispute that there's a, a significant difference. Also, it doesn't work sometimes, as, as you saw in the previous slide. Uh, well, the, the, the people came up with other um, concerns, some of them legitimate, and again, Mizuno ad addressed them. They, they wondered whether the control run was different, conditions were different than the, uh, than the, uh, act, you know, the active run. And he addressed that by putting both cells in the same box and running them one after the other without opening the box, without moving the thermocouples, without removing the insulation. Conditions remain very stable, very similar, as much as possible. Now, I'm not suggesting that all doubts have been set to rest. Mizuno would not say that either, I'm sure. We're still worried about the air flow rates. They may not be measured accurately. Um, there are expensive instruments, and we hope he can get one. Uh, you can always improve an experiment, obviously. Everyone knows that. OK, uh, summary, quickly. Uh, this is Mizuno's summary. Uh, the previous method sometimes produced spectacular results, but it was too difficult. It just took too long, and it just uh, you just couldn't explore the parameter space in in the, it, when it takes years to do one experiment. That's just not that just doesn't work. Uh, with the new method, excess heat is more easily generated, usually within a days or weeks. However, it seldom exceeds five percent excess, which is to say ten to thirty watts absolute power, one case of forty watts. Um, uh, still, it's uh, sort of surprising that it works at all. <laughs> The significant ex that significant excess heat can be obtained so easily is surprising. So here are some of my concerns, my editorializing. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I, I visited in 2013, and I wrote a paper describing the adiabatic calorimetry then being used. I concluded that it seemed to be working, but additional calibrations were needed. Months later, the additional calibrations were done, and they showed that I was wrong. Uh, there was no excess heat. So I added a retraction to the paper, which you can still read at leonardcanner.org. Um, what I'm trying to say is that you would be forgiven for thinking that Mizuno and I don't know how to do calorimetry, based on that ignominious uh, example. My second concern is that I didn't have time to review this, later work, this latest work in detail. Uh, two or three weeks is not enough. Last time, it took me uh, two months to get the wrong answer. Uh, so uh, I'm uneasy about the 5% excess. It's close to the margin. But there is also, as I said, five examples of 15 to 20%. The 99% recovery rate seems too good to be true. But however, that's what the numbers show. And finally, independent verification and replication are essential. Let me just define what I mean by verification versus replication. Verification would mean that someone, one of you, I hope, would go out there with your own instruments and ring out the calibration, find out if it really is recovering 99%, if only two watts are coming out of that box. Um, maybe, it, maybe that's true. Or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's 95. That would not affect the conclusion at all. OK, and replication, of course, means doing the entire experiment from scratch in another lab. And if you choose to do that, you will find that Mizuno is extremely helpful and will tell you everything you want to know. Um, but you really need me to interpret for you. Believe me, his English is not very good. And I've spent weeks and months, so I know I can tell you a lot about it. OK, so and, oh, and finally, I have some references. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank you very much, Jay. Yep, did, did you want to say something? No. Well, it's a very interesting case of uh, an author who has been self-critical. And Jed has raised most of the questions that is likely to arise. Well, However, close. we can probably have just one question.
before and after to see if there was a change? I don't think, I don't think that reactor is gas, well, it, I mean, it's, it's gas tight and everything, but it would be very difficult. I don't think he has a way of, of getting out a sample. He did have, I'm sorry, I, I, I correct, uh, that's, not, that's not true. He does have a way of extracting the gas, but as far as I know, he was only using that to find out if it was still, in, still had impurities. He was cycling through again and again and again and again uh, to you know, try and clean it up with the old method. I don't know that he was looking for uh, products. Well, there are no more questions. Let's thank Jed once again. It's very kind of him to come up and present the paper on behalf of. Thank you, Jed. Well, the last session. Sorry, uh, one question. I yes. we didn't have time to ask last time. Okay, please. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask you. Uh, can you tell us? Yes. Yeah. Tell ahead. us something regarding what changes by using hydrogen and deuterium. Uh, look at the tables that he put out there. Uh, I, I've, in the poster session, I put all of his recent okay. results out there. Every uh, can single you tell one. us in two words? What's it? No, I, it's, it's too complicated to sum oh, okay. up. It's, it's a bonus slide. Okay, <laughs> I've got several bonus slides, but I, th there is a lot more detail. He sent me dozens of slides, and I just I tried to cover the main ones here. And your head would spin if I were to go into the calorimetry details any more than I did. Thank you. Well, we'll come to the last paper of this session, the papers by Dr. Miley, Progress in Cluster